It's a historical fact that a, a small and frightened and foolish band of men and women said, our hopes are crushed. But then the third day came. And on the third day, God raised Jesus from the dead. On the third day, hopes were renewed. And yet we live in a second day world. But John Ortberg has a great quote, and he says this, that hope is faith waiting for tomorrow. Faith has this component of our minds where we have to believe. And it has this component of our will where we have to commit. But faith also has this component of hope. And hope comes from the heart. And just as we started this morning by recognizing the fact that our hope is built on Jesus Christ. And we take great comfort in the way that his disciples were emboldened by the fact that they had hope because of a God that came through for them. You know, the story of Scripture is a story that goes from a beginning into an end. And all the biblical writers were focused on one thing. One is to bring glory to God. It was the story of God. And it was a story that was going to recreate what happened in the garden when God and humans walked in such great harmony. And then, then some day would come where a rescuer would come and show us what it meant to live together where heaven and earth could unite together again and be together. And that was the person Jesus. And then all through scripture is the story of how God is going to recreate and bring back together that which was broken where humans and God would live one-on-one one on one together in life in a world that is recreated and new. Now, all through the Old Testament especially, the prophets only had poetry to try to describe what that day would look like, that day when God and man would be together again. And so they would use images like there would be streams of water pouring into the dry and dusty desert. Or there would be flowers that would pop up in the wilderness all of a sudden and surprise us. You know, when I was a little kid, I was a rabid baseball fan. Still am, Detroit Tigers. But when I was nine or 10, I remember so distinctly, the winter seemed so long, don't I sound old when I say that? They seemed so long and so cold. But in February, every year, the Tigers would go to Lakeland, Florida and they would start spring training. And the images we would get back of green grass and sunny skies would just mesmerize us as kids. And at the beginning of every season, Ernie Harwell, the longtime voice, the radio voice of the Detroit Tigers, he would start the first game of every spring training. And he would read from the Song of Songs. And it's one of those descriptions that kind of fit that whole image of what it means for, for a world that's coming. And he would say this. He would say, lo, the long winter is over. The rains have come and gone. Flowers appear again on the earth. And he read from the New King James, so he would say, and the voice of the turtle was heard in our land. It was mesmerizing the idea that that was such a great way to capture not only what was true for us, but it was also true in the biblical sense of what was true in the world. Now, we have a great advantage here in the upper Midwest. I don't know if you've been looking out your window these days, but spring is coming. But we live in a world where I think we, have, we live in a great metaphor for what it's going to mean someday for this, this recreated world, this world that Jesus was, was alluding to and was ushering in, that someday what he was going to do, and we can look out our windows and see it. You all know images like this one, where we are in the midst of a great big snow storm. This, has happened, uh, this happened this year and back in November, actually. It wasn't too bad after that, but we live in a world that seems so cold and so dark and so desolate at times. But if you've noticed and you've looked out your window, the very first flower, flowers of spring are starting to emerge. In fact, this image here is an, Im an image of the crocus flower. It's even referred to in scripture. It's the first and little hardy flower that comes up. They're already almost done now in Michigan. But the idea of spring emerging in the midst of all that we're going through is such a powerful reminder. And maybe if you get nothing else this morning, you remember that the crocus flower, that spring is still powerfully advancing regardless. And sometimes it looks like this, of course. The snow doesn't quite let up and the flowers still are, are kind of exposed to it. But the point is that they have, they have somehow emerged in spite of all the, the things that are going on around us. The snow can represent what it's like to live in a second day world. 
But we have a God who has come and redeemed and created a third day, the redemption day, the day that God wants to take us to. You know, we're in a series called Waypoints, and a waypoint is a navigational term. It's a, it's a term to describe when you don't know exactly where you're going. If you knew some, some, some checkpoints along the way, you would be able to recenter yourself and just go a little bit farther. And so last week, Craig talked about what it's like to admit that we're adrift. And in it, he said, if we could just internalize this image that Jesus brought us, which was to calm the chaos in our spirits, so that no matter what the waves were doing around us, we could live in peace and confidence. And if we could internalize that, that's a checkpoint for us. We could put a, we could put a stake down and say, from there we can go just a little bit further. Well, today I want to talk about another waypoint, and it's called this. It's called asking for help. You know, and a friend uh, just sent me a quote just last week, and he, it said this. It said, most Christians, most Christians arrange their life in such a way that they're not dependent on God, nor anyone else. And a crisis like this has a way of sort of showing the fallacy of that kind of sentiment. But I think we can all relate to it. We arrange our lives in such a way that we're not dependent on God nor anyone else. You know, several years ago, I became aware of a study that was conducted by, about for thousands of Christians to ask them this question is, when was the time or what were the things that caused you to have the most spiritual growth in your life? And I was really surprised by the answer. You know, it wasn't preaching great messages. It wasn't joining a small group. It wasn't serving in the local church. It wasn't doing the things that I normally would have thought of would have created that. But the, what the number one answer was, it was suffering. Times of pain and loss and sorrow where when people thought to themselves, that's when I grew the most. That's when the scaffolding of my life was shaken. In some cases, it was completely removed, and I had only one place to turn. I had to turn to our Heavenly Father, and I had to ask for help, and I grew during those times. Well, I became kind of alarmed because one of my roles at the church is to arrange staff and programs and funding around programs that will help people grow spiritually, and we had nothing. We had nothing to help people to know how to, go through, how to suffer or to arrange pain for people. That wasn't in our mindset at all. But suffering has such a way, and because we're collectively suffering in so many ways, it gives us a chance to, to maybe grow in ways that we would never have wanted or expected. It's an unprecedented time of transition for all of us. And I think of so many ways that people are suffering right now. You know, people, obviously, those that are sick and those that love people that are going through this from, from a physical standpoint, suffering. I think of people that are cut isolated. Maybe they live alone, and this is just furthering the isolation that they feel, suffering. I think of families that are just have a house full of kids, and while it might be joyful on many levels, there's little room for any kind of individual expression, and that can be just a, another form of just compression and suffering. And I think so much of the people that, that we love and care about and we we want so much to unfold into the life that a Christian community can offer. And they're suffering because they're turning to things that maybe won't help them or maybe will even hurt them during a time like this. And so just this collective sense that we're suffering. So I thought maybe today we could just spend a few moments, the time that we have together, and just talk about what are some things that if we really considered them and we internalized them, that they would create in us and for us a waypoint a point that we could put down and we could say, this is, this is where God met with us and this, these are the things that are important for me to know and realize. Well, there's three points that I want to cover today. And the first one is this. You are a prized possession. You are a prized possession. The second one is God is with us. God is with us. And the third one is God can be trusted. You are a prized possession. God is with us, and God can be trusted. Well, I have to tell you a story to start. Back in my 20s, I lived in rural Virginia, and I lived on the back of a farm. It was one of those old plantation farms, and the, it was typical of a lot of the old farms in that area. Lots of acreage, land rich, but cash poor. And the landlady, the, the owner, who was trying to make a go of it, was desperately trying to find ways to make money on this farm. And I was just a, 
I was just a tenant on the back living in a home there. But I got very involved in the life of the farm because inevitably that's what happens. And she decided her money-making idea was going to be to raise sheep. And so she bought a, a, a small flock of sheep. In fact, there's a picture that's, that's coming up on your screen. I think it's the only picture I took that entire year because that was before cell phones. But it, it's actually the, the, the farm and the flock that she started. Her whole dream was to sell custom lamb so that people that wanted to use lamb as a, as a centerpiece for a Passover meal or something like that, they would find high value. And so the very first lamb that, uh, that she wanted to, to sell that way, she got a call from a family, a Greek Orthodox family that wanted it for their spring feast. And so now when you picture a lamb, I, I know you can picture these little tiny ones. A lamb goes all the way up to 100 pounds, a, year, a yearling, a year old, and that's how big this one was. And she asked me if, to do her a favor. She said, would you please transport it to the processing place? It was a custom processing place. Would you transport it for me? And then they'll pick it up from there. It's on your way to work, and, and it would be great. And I thought, nothing of it. Sure, of course, I'd be happy to. This was the lamb, by the way, that was going to kick off her business. From this particular experience, the people that were buying it said, we will buy 100 of them in the years to come. We just want to see how this works, how this goes. And, and this is really kind of the most the most prized thing for her. So, of course, I loaded in the back of my little tiny pickup, and I, I actually had a, a small dog kennel. So the lamb very willingly caught it easily, put it in the kennel, and drove it to the processing center to 20 minutes away. When I got there, um, I mean, it was the most docile-looking thing I've ever seen in the back of this truck. But as soon as I reached to unclasp the, the door of the little kennel that he, that, that he was laying in, it exploded out of the kennel. I mean, exploded, and it was on a dead run. And before I could even move, and I've had, I had some experience, he was gone. And so this bleeding lamb is now running across this big open field. And in the field are cows with their calves. Well, cows are protective, and this little thing running towards them looks in all the world like a predator. So now this prized lamb, this most valuable possession, is being chased by a group of cows with their calves tagging along. And finally, he exited this field, and I'm chasing him because I, I figure I've got to find, I've got to catch this lamb. It's the most important thing to my landlady, and I was, put in, I was entrusted with it. I remember running through the backyards of several homes that were adjacent to the field. At one point, I crossed over a, a, a chain that was laid out in the field, and attached to the chain was a St. Bernard, a full-grown St. Bernard who was sleeping. The lamb went first. And I went second, and just as I turned around, I saw that dog come to the end of its chain, and it was fully extended. It was quite a scene. Fortunately, there wasn't any video cameras in that time, but it was quite a scene. Eventually, eventually, it took about an hour. I chased this thing down. I was by myself trying to catch it. The guys that were there, they were just flummoxed by the whole thing. I ended up catching it. And I, at first I was like, I will kill for this lamb. And then I wanted to be killed because I didn't want to face my landlady if something happened to it. It was the most prized possession. And I would have done anything. And I would have gone to great lengths to catch that lamb on behalf of her. Well, let's look. I wanted to look at a scripture with you because I think it also points to what a prized possession really looks like. It's in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 43 and here's the, here's the words. It'll come up on your screen, but let's read through those. But now this is what the Lord says. He cre who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now the order of these verses are so critical. And I have a confession to make. When I was first pastoring 20, 22 years ago, and I would visit people in the hospital, I would read these verses. Because I always loved the part where it said, when you walk through the rivers, and when you walk through the fire, you can count on not having it sweep over you and not being set ablaze. But then I, I started to watch people go through such hard times. And I forgot about the first verse. I just focused on the when these things would happen and the difficulty that was ahead for so many people. And so for a while I stopped praying these verses because I was afraid that I was misguiding people, that somehow 
that they thought that, that by just praying this and that they were a prized possession, right, but, but these were the difficulties that they were going through. But I forgot about something very important. And a pastor friend pointed this out to me, a guy named Tim Schroeder, thankful to him. He said, don't forget the first verse. The first verse is the most important part. See, if you go back and look at the first verse, it says this. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you, he said, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. You see, God is saying, you are such a prized possession. You are so precious to me. I would do anything. Then no matter what happens, all those whens, when you go through this, and when you go through this, and when you go through this, I want you to know, I have summoned you by name. You are mine. For I am the whole Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So I think it's really super important when we think about a verse like this that we remind ourselves of the critical nature of the order of them. You know, it's really easy in these days to get caught up with all the things that are happening. But let's remember first that you're a prized possession. You have a God who's created you, informed you, who has summoned you by name. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're going through. You are his. And I hope that is something that will give you some hope today. And I encourage you this week, maybe pull out these verses, Isaiah 43, 1 through 3, and just meditate on those things. Just meditate on what God is saying about you because he wants you to know that he has formed you, that he has redeemed you, that he has summoned you, that you are his. So that's the first point. I wanted you to be sure that you knew what the ownership factor looked like. My dream is that you'll spend some time joining me this week and pray through these verses and really internalize them each morning because that's something that I'm trying to take on myself. Okay, second discovery along the way to this waypoint. God is with us. So you're a prized possession and God is with us. So much of scripture talks about God being with us. One that I'd like to read to you today is from Hebrews chapter 13, verses five and six. It says this, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Psalm 23, the valley of the shadow of death, though I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil, for you, you are with me. Jesus would repeat it on his last days. He would tell his, his followers, I will be with you always. We have a God who is with us. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced a time when you've had somebody with you that sort of emboldened you, made you a little stronger than you would have been yourself. But if we could live that way, it would give you tremendous confidence. Another story. So back in my early 20s, I lived out in Washington State, and a buddy of mine asked me one year to go canoeing with him in British Columbia, the remote, a remote northern part of Washington into British Columbia. And it was a chain of lakes, and we were going to canoe up there. We'd be all alone. It's a 15-mile long lake, and we would be able to kind of canoe up and down and fish and do some of that stuff. Um, and it was slightly developed, so there was designated campsites along this lake and very rustic. Uh, but we decided, okay, sure, we'll do it. Now, this is about the time, I'm not a great camper, but I do, I do enjoy being outside. I do love adventure. But my friend Jack, he was all about it. And he was, he, he was one of those guys who was equipped, you know, the knife on the belt, and he was ready for virtually anything. And he'd been there before, so I had confidence that we would make it okay. So the first day we got out there, we, we started to canoe, and we were paddling up this lake, and it was one of those 95-degree days, super hot, only people out there, forests coming right down to the lake, so dark, very, very uh, ominous in lots of ways. I should point out that Bigfoot was making a resurgence right about then, and he'd been showing up in the North Cascades. I don't know if you believe in that, but there's a lot of people that did. Anyway, we, we got there just after dark, where we, we finally found the campsite. It was too late and hot to think about putting up the tent, so we, we said, how about we, we just take these two these ramshackle uh, picnic tables and put them kind of side by side. We'll get a small fire. We don't really need a fire for warmth, but we'll just use a fire to keep any of the animals away, and we'll just sleep on the picnic tables. Sounded great. So we both fell asleep, sound asleep, um, and I remember it was sort of this eerie feeling like in the middle of the night, 
I sensed that there was something moving in the camp. I felt like there was, there was an animal or something. I smelled it. I was kind of in, drowsy in and out, but I sensed that there was something in, in the camp. And I could, hear, I could hear little tiny footsteps, but it started to sound like that something was moving. And so I knew I was going to have to open my eyes. And just as I did that, I felt this on my face. I felt a flutter on my cheek. I mean, my heart was pounding through my chest. And when I opened my eye, right next to my face was an eye. This is how big it looked. I mean, it... It's, it's scary. I, you know, what was attached to the eye? First of all, I thought it's a floating eye. But then I thought of all the worst things it could be. I, re, I scrolled through all the major predators of North America. I got the Sasquatch. I wasn't happy about that option either. Turns out the eye belonged to a deer. And because we had been so sweat covered, we apparently were like two big salt licks. Well, I yelled, uh, still kind of embarrassed. I yelled, but Jack was completely calm. And I can tell you, I would not have gone back to sleep that night if I'd have been alone. But having somebody with me changed the whole dynamic. Every teenager who's been left alone by their parents for a couple of days and say, hey, you're in charge of the house, they know what that means. When you're by yourself, it's a whole different story than when somebody is with you. So the second thing I want you to remember that we don't have to be afraid because we have a God who has promised that he would be with us. And it's so challenging at times like this to count on that promise, but I hope you will. Maybe you'll meditate on a verse like this with me this week and just consider that God has said, I will be with you. I will not forsake you. I will always be with you. So please join me this week in, in really focusing on that. So the two, the two things that we've just talked about so far. First of all, that you're a prized possession. Second of all, that God is with you. And thirdly, God can be trusted. All of us right now, we've just entered into trust school. The things that we count on, the things that are normal to us, every single thing has caused us to be a little bit shaken and trust is something that we really are going to need to develop in order to survive these times. Who would have imagined that we'd be worried about things being empty on grocery shelves that doesn't happen around the world. In fact, I remember a time that we were in Jamaica on a mission trip, and we went to the Sunday service at this little community that we were serving, and uh, they sang this song at the offering, and they said, thank you, God, for food to eat. Thank you, God, for shoes on our feet. And I thought, wow, I had never prayed for shoes on my feet. But to them, it was real, and it was something to thank God for. And I think all of a sudden we've been sort of cast into this world that we have to now trust God in ways that we haven't trusted him before. You know, the early church, the early church had to come up with ways to just have confidence in God and their foundation, just as we sang, was Christ alone. The same scared people that had sort of worked their way through watching the crucifixion and realizing that maybe what they had counted on was destroyed forever those same people began to trust once they saw what God would do and what God intended. But we're in trust school. Nobody gets a pass on this. We all have to learn what it means to trust, even when trust is difficult. One of the things that I so love about the life of Jesus, if you read about some of his teachings and the way that he communicated, he was so conscious of the character of the Father. The character of the Father could be trusted. He kept referring to it, and he kept drawing strength from it himself personally. But the idea that, that, that God the Father could be trusted, even in his last final hours, you just see that coming through, coming through. God, I'm going to trust you. I don't love this journey, but I'm going to trust you because you know what's best. And I'd like to have you ref just maybe look at another scripture with me. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is talking, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, but he's talking to his friends and he's asking, he's, he's telling this Galilean hillside that, that there are things about God that they can really count on. And there's these very famous verses and he, 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 he says this, he's talking about prayer. He says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. But here's what comes next. Jesus says this, which of you, which of you, 
If your son asked for bread, you would give him a stone. And which of you, if your son asked for a fish, you'd give him a snake? And I don't like the next verse very much. We don't have it on the screen, but it says, oh, for those of you who are evil, even you would do good things for your kids. Jesus is saying, you know, I know who you are. You guys, you try your best, but there are times that you mess up. But you would give something good. If your child asked you for something that they needed to sustain them, the character of a father is to say yes. It's to give. It's to provide. It's to give out of the goodness of who he is so that you can count on the goodness of God. Sometimes these verses are taken out of context. Sometimes we yank out the verses, ask, seek, knock, and people kind of consider that sometimes a blank check theology, that somehow God's just going to provide because I've asked. But Jesus would say, no, no, no. Don't separate the rest of the verses, which are that the character of God is a God who wants to provide, who wants to give. And every parent knows, every parent knows that a wise parent doesn't always say yes. A wise parent has perspective and long-term in, in mind. I remember my boys went through a stage when they were younger and Pop-Tarts were their favorite meal and they always wanted one at dinner time. And I was really close to my kids and I would give them almost anything, but when they wanted a Pop-Tart at dinner time and I said no, they turned on me. I'm the enemy now. And it's because we so often, they, they did not have the perspective that a wise parent had of what that would contribute not only to their nutrition or maybe cavities or other things down the road. But, God, but Jesus wants us to know that a wise parent is also a parent that is a parent that's eager to give and to provide and to support their kids. So I, one of the things that we are concluding today is that we have to ask for help. One of the challenges for us very independent-minded people is to say, you know what, God, I don't have this all figured out. Yes, I'm glad to know that I'm a precious possession. Yes, I'm glad to know that you're with me. But now I need to learn what it means to trust you. And I need to draw strength from that, Father. I need to ask for help. And it's as simple as that. And maybe you haven't asked for help in a very long time, not from anyone else and certainly not from God. And I think this is a time that you can go to your father and you can say, Father, help me. I admit that I'm adrift. I admit that I don't have all the answers. And I'm afraid. But I just ask, would you just help me? And the character of our father is to provide. You know, in ancient Israel, the Israelites were released from bondage and slavery to the Egyptians. And Moses came along and he, he rescued them on behalf of God and took them into the wilderness. And you know the journey from Egypt on the trade route to the promised land was about a two-week journey. Forty years the Israelites were in the desert. Forty years in the wilderness and the whole time God was saying, I took you out of Egypt you're a ragtag bunch of ex-slaves. You've been exposed to hundreds and hundreds of years of idol worship on behalf of the Egyptians. And I need you to represent me to the nations, and therefore, I need you to trust me. We have to have the kind of relationship that we can completely count on each other. So when Pharaoh came after them and the sea was in front of them, God was asking, will you trust me? I'll make a way. When they ran out of water in the desert, they were asking, can I trust God to provide? He made a way. When they were out of food in the desert, God provided food. When the food was the same every single day, God kept the food coming. Will you trust me? God is saying, we are going to learn how to trust because I am a God who provides. Well, one last verse. It's in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It's a new favorite of mine, and so I'm using it a lot. But it says this, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, asking for help is something that we don't have to do with formality. Jesus dispensed with all that. He made it possible for us to walk right into the, to the presence of the Father so we, we can approach him with confidence. And this is what we get. We get mercy. Mercy says, I understand. Mercy says, I know. I know. 
I know what you're going through. Mercy says, I will come close to you in the midst of all this. We'll always receive mercy. One great scripture talks about heaven's mercies being new every single morning. Mercy. Sometimes it's tangible mercy. You'll say, God, I just can't take it anymore. I'm done with this. And the phone will ring. Or a friend will come by. Well, a friend will knock on the window and let you know that they're thinking about you. Sometimes it's intangible mercy. It's a sense inside of you that just says, okay, all right, I don't have this figured out, but I can trust and God has provided me with mercy. And then he says you will receive grace. And grace in this sense is God is going to give us the endurance and the strength to endure. The endurance and the strength to endure. He'll give us contentment when we don't feel like our hearts are very content at all. Contentment will say things to us like, I could live with it, I could live without it, I wish I had it, but if I don't, I know, God, you will give me just enough to get through this day. Grace is the endurance and the strength to get through this. Well, in closing, I would just like to say these three things, just to remind you again. You are a prized possession. God is with us. He's with you. He's going through this with us. And then finally, you can trust your Heavenly Father. The whole foundation of our faith, the whole foundation of Christianity is on a person. It's on Jesus Christ. And if you reach your hand out and you just say, God, I'm adrift and I need help, I don't even know how to ask for help, or I'm tired of asking for help, we have a God who is eager, eager to provide for you, and I hope you will. In closing, I'd just like to say this. John Orpberg wrote this great article about crisis and what we do in crisis, and he says this. When a crisis hits, when the stock market plummets, when your morale is sinking and your health is collapsing, you may wonder, is anything going up? The answer is yes. The chance to trust God when trusting isn't easy is wide open. The prospect for modeling hope for a hope-needy world is trending upward, and the possibility of, of cultivating a storm-proof faith is always on the rise. This is because certain truths remain unchanged. You are precious to your Heavenly Father. God is with you. God can be trusted. God remains sovereign. Grace beats sin, prayers get heard, the Bible endures. Heaven's mercies are new every morning, and the cross still testifies to the power of sacrificial love. The tomb is still empty, and God's kingdom is still advancing without our help to bail it out. God is still in the business of redemption bringing something very, very, very good out of something that might appear very, very bad. Crisis is a good time in the cure of souls. All we have to do is ask for help. Well, once again, we're so glad that you were able to join us today. But we hope that you'll continue to engage with the material throughout the week. You can go to our website and download sermon questions. You can get these verses that we talked about today, and maybe that'll further your study. If you're part of a small group already, these provide great resources to talk about further. But if you're not part of a group, we would love to welcome you into a virtual small group. If you're live streaming right now, you can get information on the live stream about how to connect with our groups, or you can text this phone number. It's 616-425-5378. Just text us your name, and one of our team will get back in touch with you, and we'll help you find the right group for you. Groups are meeting throughout the week and on Sundays. Love to encourage you and invite you to join us with that. Again, on behalf of all of us, we are so grateful that you joined us today. And we can't wait for the day that we can all be together in one room and enjoy each other's fellowship one more time. Thank you again for joining us. May your week be blessed. May it be safe. And may God hold you in the palm of his hand. God bless. <laughs>